you're an avid movie watcher, chances are you've seen at least one film from The Asylum. It may have been one of their intentionally bad monster films, like Mega Shark vs. Giant Octopus, or perhaps you were duped into watching a mockbuster. You settled in to watch Battle Los Angeles, but instead what you saw was Battle of Los Angeles. Maybe it was the incredibly clever 111111 instead of 111111. Or maybe you're just like me and you enjoy some gleefully ridiculous low budget cinema. Whatever the case, the Asylum are making movies that are making money and they aren't going away anytime soon. If anything, they're getting bigger and more brazen. Case in point is this week's movie, Sharknado. Sharknado is a 2013 action horror comedy directed by Anthony C. Ferrante. If you're watching this film expecting Jaws or even Deep Blue Sea, you're doing it wrong. The movie opens with what else? A bunch of sharks and a tornado. Not gonna waste any time here. Then we get some titles taken straight out of any After Effects introductory course. 20 miles off the coast of Mexico, some shark poachers are making a deal. The stock footage tells the crew there's a storm coming. The boat is then attacked by the hungriest sharks you've ever seen. Um, nom, 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 oh, nom, 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 nom. The storm kicks up and swallows the boat. We then cut to the opening of Baywatch. Finn and his friend Baz are getting ready to go surfing. This girl's taking an awful long time to put on her wetsuit. Over in Finn's bar, appropriately named Finn, we meet Nova. Well, Nova's ass. She's talking to old touchy-feely George. Hey, I'm not that old. You know, I've still got some moves, you know, babe. Hey, uh, what did I tell you? You can touch everything this bar except for me. Hey, Oopsie. Looks like you need another drink. The news is reporting on a hurricane that's driving hundreds of sharks closer to the shore. The wetsuit girl goes out to meet Steve Sanders and is promptly eaten. What beach is this? That's not the one we saw a minute ago. The sharks move in and eat anyone in the water. Why are the people running off the beach? The sharks can't get to them on land, unless it's armed and dangerous. Baz gets attacked by the dreaded stealth shark and Finn saves him. Hang on! Nah, don't hang on. Hang on! Nah, don't hang on. The lifeguard's bandaging Baz's leg. Sweet, she's taking her top off. Uh, oh, never mind. Hurricane? Massive shark attack? No need to close up shop, let's get to drinking. Finn's worried about the hurricane, so he calls his ex-wife April. Hello, Wexner residence. April, it's Finn. Yeah, Finn, I know your voice, what do you want? And I think she hangs up pictures of herself so she knows she's in the right house. The hurricane's kicking up the waves, so Finn closes the bar. Just look at those waves that seem to be localized exactly outside of the bar. A shark leaps into the bar and Nova kills it. Everyone's leaving, and not only do they have to contend with giant waves and gale force winds, but hungry, pissed off sharks. The Ferris wheel comes loose and rolls after everyone. Clearly, they've seen Prometheus. The news is talking about the storm that just tore through the beach. We are here live at the Santa Monica Pier. This is what remains after the massive storm tore through this popular attraction. Yeah, look at all this devastation. Lifeguard stations intact, trees not knocked over, families out enjoying the water. It's like Armageddon, I tell you. Finn, Nova, Baz, and George all head to April's house to check on her and his daughter. They drive inland through majorly flooded roads, even though a minute ago it was bone dry. The sharks have now taken over the streets because, uh, sure, why not? What the hell are sharks in the streets? One of the sharks is under the car. Why are they panicking? It's not like the shark is going to carjack them or something. Actually, now that I think about it, it is an asylum film. I wouldn't put it past them. They make their way to a ramp and a bunch of cars are broken down. Conveniently, though, they're spaced out so the truck can easily maneuver around them. The water's spilling into the ramp, and the sharks are eating the idiots outside of their cars. The group goes to rescue the people that are trapped. It's like an inch of water out here, folks. You gotta move! George goes to rescue a dog, but gets eaten. The appropriate remark while being ingested by a shark, Oh crap. Ow. Ah. George is dead. Oh, who will sexually harass me now? The group finally makes it to... You can tell it's Beverly Hills by the Family Mart store. They get to April's house. Tara Reed shows off her impressive acting skills. Now will you let us in? No, I told you not to come. No, just go away. Take your little stripper friend and bad leave. 
Keep in mind, this is the actress that Uwe Boll actually said he would never hire again. Finn wants to take April and his daughter Claudia further inland, but April's douchey new boyfriend is against that. Thankfully, a shark flies in through the window and kills him. Yes, an IKEA particle board cabinet is just the thing to hold back a 500 pound shark. Nova gets out of the water and fills the shark with lead. Hey, uh, I know you must be devastated since you just lost your boyfriend and all, but uh, I can't pass up this opportunity for a one-liner. Looks like it's that time of the month. Finn distracts the shark while the rest of them head outside. The water's waist deep in the house, so it must be at least a foot or two outside, or not even at all. They drive away and the house crumbles to the ground. The builders of that multi-million dollar mansion really cut some corners. The group heads to an airfield to pick up Finn's son, Matt. Finn sees a school bus full of children surrounded by sharks. April takes this opportunity to nag him. Well, she's certainly seen better days. Finn moves the truck to the bridge overhead so he can rappel down and rescue the kids because who doesn't keep rappelling gear in their car at all times? How deep is this water? It can't be that deep. This road is pretty dry and it's like five feet away. Finn rescues the kids and their hippie teacher. Finn's climbing the rope and is a shark really climbing up after him? This is awesome! He cuts the rope and makes it to safety. The wind kicks up and the Hollywood sign starts flying off. So, we got Finn, Nova, Claudia, April, Baz, and Hippie Teacher Guy. If you guess the hippie teacher is gonna get killed, give yourself a bell. My mom always told me Hollywood would kill me. That was very Final Destination-y. Hey, didn't a giant letter just slam into the bridge? Where'd it go all of a sudden? Traffic doesn't seem to be too affected by it. Finally, we see some full-on shark nados. Sharks, what are you doing? You're not helicopters. A shark bites its way into the truck, so they kill it, but somehow it cut the gas line and the truck explodes. They stop at a liquor store to get some supplies. Good to know, in the middle of the shark apocalypse, you can still get booze. A news alert pops up on the L monitor. They break into a car lot and steal a souped-up Humvee. They drive through a police barricade and the cops chase after them. Good thing this Hummer has nitrous. They get to the airport as the first Sharknado makes land. The group finds Matt and some others hiding in the hangar. The teacher wanders off and gets sucked through the roof. The group hides and survives, but the hangar gets trashed. They get outside and see there's a helicopter that's untouched. Matt looks at the outside of the helicopter and somehow knows that it works. Hey, you know what? She'll fly. The group decides they're going to make a stand and fight the Sharknados. Sure. Semper Paratus. Oh, what? Now there's piranhas? They see a supply shot to make weapons. Baz builds some bombs so they can blow up the tornadoes. They're going to blow up the tornadoes. We're venturing into Michael Bay territory here, people. Finn grabs a chainsaw, April grabs hedge clippers, and Claudia updates her Facebook status. Matt notices Nova's scar. Oh, don't look at my scar, even though I wear bikinis and cut off shorts. Nova tells Matt about how she was attacked by a shark when she was a kid, and now she hates sharks. So let me get this straight. They're going to fly a helicopter into the Sharknados and drop bombs into them. I just want to make sure that this is actually happening. The shark attacks the chopper, so Finn shoots them. He's shooting at a tornado. Would that work? Would any of this work? They drop a bomb and take out the first Sharknado. The sharks are falling out of the sky. They kill one of the kids and Baz. They drop a bomb and blow up the second Sharknado. More sharks are falling out of the sky. The red shirt kid gets killed and add insult to injury. <laughs> Claudia swings an axe and I think Post forgot to put the shark effect in. The remainder of the group heads to a veteran retirement home. The sharks are dropping into the pool, so Finn somehow manages to blow up water. Run! They try to blow up the last Sharknado, but it doesn't work. Nova falls out and gets eaten by a shark. Matt loses control and crashes the helicopter. Finn rescues him and surprisingly, the chopper doesn't blow up. The Hummer's filled with explosives, so Finn drives it into the final Sharknado. Did he just do a hang 10 to the Sharknado? So now hundreds of hungry growling sharks are falling all over Los Angeles. Finn runs back to the group, and here comes the money shot. He 
He cuts his way out, and oh yeah, this was the same shark that ate Nova. They stare off into the city to see the devastation that, let's face it, they had a lot to do with. Then the outro song is just about perfect. The movie was filmed mostly in Los Angeles and Santa Monica, California, in 18 days for $2 million, the asylum's most expensive film to date. The movie was shot in January, so the water was very cold. There's the director in a cameo because he couldn't find anybody willing to run out into the cold water again. The mansion sequence was actually inside of a pool. They built the set in a pool so they would have an easier time filling it with water. They didn't put on a roof, which is why you never see any shots past a certain level. The original title for the film was Dark Skies. It was way too serious for this kind of movie, so they changed it to Sharknado. When the movie was first announced, there was a very positive buzz starting because it just sounded hilarious. Lots of fake shark-related disaster posters popped up like shark a cane Sharkano, and shark a these may sound ridiculous, but keep in mind, Arachnoquake exists. Anyway, when the film finally aired, Twitter exploded with a nonstop barrage of Sharknado-related tweets. And while the film's first airing didn't have the highest ratings, the repeat a week later had a massive jump in viewers, probably due to the people wanting to get in on the Twitter fun. The movie aired again, and once more, viewership increased. The movie went viral, much in the way that Snakes on a Plane did years earlier. Unfortunately for Snakes on a Plane, it had a much bigger budget to recoup, and it didn't pull in as much as they had hoped. Which leads me to this. Let's talk about the Asylum. First, a little history. The Asylum was founded back in 1997 as a small production and distribution house. They originally wanted to buy up small horror films and teen sex comedies for distribution, but larger companies like Lionsgate got the rights to all the good ones because they had more money. After losing out on many movies, they decided instead to take the money and make their own. After a series of unremarkable films, they accidentally struck gold. They were running low on funds and bankruptcy was looming. In 2005, they were working on an adaptation of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. They found out Paramount was doing a big-budget version with Spielberg at the helm. They almost halted production until Blockbuster Video told them that if they finished the film, they'd order 100,000 copies for their stores. Blockbuster explained to them that there was a market for people who wanted to see the movie but didn't want to go to the theater to do so. They found that for every blockbuster that came out, people would come looking for similar movies to rent. Seeing the potential, the Asylum shot King of the Lost World, which was a knockoff, or mockbuster, of King Kong. Blockbuster bought 100,000 copies, and the company was saved. The company moved into full swing and made an assortment of mockbusters. Snakes on a Train, The Da Vinci Treasure, When a Killer Calls, and 666 The Child. As the years went on, they started making more and more movies. They shifted to a movie-a-month schedule. That was film a movie in a month, send it to post, and have it on the market within six. While the Asylum still makes mockbusters, it's only about 30% of their business. They also make giant monster movies like Mega Python vs. Gatoroid, teen sex comedies like Sex Pot, and even started a religious and family production house called Faith Films, with movies like Sunday School Musical, and Princess and the Pony. The Asylum film started doing very well in video on demand, and they noticed another trend. Movies that started with numbers, or the letter A, were getting viewed more because they were the first things to come up on video on demand. So they started making movies with titles like Number One Cheerleader Camp and 8213 Gacy House. Their production schedule is huge now, with an expected 26 movies to be released in 2013. Sci-Fi started picking up their films for syndication under their Sci-Fi Originals line. The folks at Sci-Fi would give them a set list, which is what they were looking for, and it usually involved lots of blood, monster fights, and pretty girls. So now with money coming in from Redbox, Netflix, Video On Demand, and Sci-Fi, the Asylum was doing quite well. I have to laugh every time I see a post on a message board saying that the people at Sci-Fi should be fired because they have no idea what they're doing. Let me let you in on a little secret. They know exactly what they're doing. People think of low-budget films being less than $10 million. For the Asylum's earlier productions, they had a budget of about $50,000. Eventually that moved to an average of about 100000 with most films now coming in at about two hundred and fifty to 500000 Now occasionally larger productions like Atlantic Rim get a million, but they usually try to stay under that. They had a lot of faith in Sharknado, hence the gamble with the bigger budget. The Asylum has a group of directors they like working with. Getting a job directing with them usually consists of getting a phone call saying, Hey, uh, we're going to do a movie next week. You want in? If you agree, you get a script emailed to you, and a few days later, you're flying out to do a movie. Ever since they redid their business plan in 2005, they have yet to produce a film that has lost money. Put that up against the barrage of Hollywood blockbusters that have underperformed, and they're looking pretty good. Sure, they're not pulling in hundreds of millions of dollars, but they are living quite comfortably. 
If one of their films did fail, they would only be out about a million dollars, as opposed to the likes of The Lone Ranger, which is out $250 million. Did anyone really want this? Johnny Depp has a bird on his head. Now they have a little extra money to throw down. They've started to bring in more name actors. Now, not the George Clooney's of the world, but people like Jake Busey or Ving Rhames. Names that people recognize, but they're not exactly making big budget movies anymore. So for all the people that said that these actors should fire their agents after making one of these films, keep in mind they're being paid a substantial amount of money for a few weeks of work. Plus, in the case of Sharknado, it gets their names out there again, which opens up new jobs. No, they aren't getting millions like a Hollywood production, but I would gladly take 20 grand for 18 days of work. Another complaint is people say if only they tried a little harder, they could actually make a better movie. Well, they started putting more effort into some of their productions, but then they discovered that they weren't selling any better. Essentially, they said, why bother? If they're both going to sell the same amount, why put forth the effort? They ran into trouble with some of their mockbusters because some studios would sue them over the movies and their release schedules. The big one that caught on the news was American Battleship, which was a mockbuster of Battleship. They lost the court hearing and had to change the name to American Warships. They also lost Age of the Hobbits, which was changed to Clash of the Empires. I think this is ridiculous that there are some studios going after them. The amount of money they spent on lawyers far outweighs any amount they would have lost by some confusion. The studios argued that they're misleading the public. I'm sorry, but if you mistook something like Sherlock Holmes starring Robert Downey Jr. and Jude Law for Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes starring Ben Snyder, well, that's your own fault. All you have to do is look at the cover and you should know that they're not the same movie. The Asylum cover has a T-Rex, an octopus, and a fire-breathing pterodactyl. So we should know right away which is the better film. Actually, in this case, it's the Asylum version. The Asylum is just following trends. How is what they do any different from when one studio puts out Armageddon and another puts out Deep Impact? Dante's Peak and Volcano? Mirror Mirror and Snow White and the Huntsman? So back to Sharknado. What a blast. This is definitely one of the Asylum's best features. It takes itself just serious enough, and even though it's filled with glaring errors, that's the kind of thing that makes these movies worthwhile. Get together with a bunch of friends, watch the movie, and have a great time. Ian Ziering was actually really good, and Casey Serbo was super hot. Tara Reid looked like she didn't realize what kind of movie this was until it was too late, and while the other actors seemed to go in with gusto, she felt like she was phoning the whole performance in. I've seen a few people shocked that John Hurd would lower himself to being in a film like this. Need I remind you that he was in White Chicks, which I would put in a few layers lower than this. Well, except for Terry Crews. He's the only good thing about that movie. To the people on the IMDb giving this bad ratings, did you not realize you were watching a movie called Sharknado? If you groan when you hear the title, you should already know that this movie isn't for you. So why watch it and then bitch about the quality? The movie makes no bones about what it is. It's Sharks in a tornado. Still more believable than Twister. Too old for you? I don't think. I'm not your boss. Too out free. 